Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining tonight's peer-to-peer -peer webinar focused on patient selection utilizing the new Enhanced SmartOS 2.4 software. My name is Bridget Coberts, Product Manager for the Sonata System. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to begin with a quick Zoom overview. As we move through the discussion this evening, we'd like to encourage you all to ask any questions or comments using the Q&A or chat features below. With me today, I am thrilled to have my colleague Tara Murphy alongside Dr. Leslie Hansen Lindner and Dr. Taranay Shirazian. Dr. Hansen Lindner practices in Charlotte, North Carolina at Atrium Health and is currently the chief of the Department of OB-GYN at Carolina's Medical Center. She received her MD and training at the University of Pennsylvania and has practiced at Atrium for over 25 years. She is a clinical adjunct professor at Wake Forest University and is active in medical student education. Dr. Hansen Lindner's clinical interests focus on advancing minimally invasive and hysteroscopic procedures for the management of abnormal uterine bleeding and fibroids. Dr. Hansen Lindner is a co-author of the Journal of Clinical Medicine article, Transcervical Fibroid Ablation, TFA, an update on pregnancy outcomes. Dr. Tarane Shirazian serves as the director of the Center for Fibroid Care, the Division of Global and Community Women's Health and Global Women's Health at NYU Global Institute of Public Health and is an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She is board certified and completed her residency at Mount Sinai Medical Center, earning her MD from Brown University. Specializing in managing benign gynecologic conditions, Dr. Shrazian is dedicated to improving patient quality of life through personalized treatment plans and innovative technologies. She is also a passion, passionate advocate for global women's health, serving as president and medical director of Saving Mothers, a nonprofit she founded. Dr. Shirazian is a recognized voice in national media and the editor in chief of Around the Globe for Women's Health, a practical guide for the healthcare provider. To kick off this evening's discussion, we'd love to start by hearing from you. In order to understand your current experience with Sonata, a poll will pop up on your screen asking a few questions. Please take a quick moment to answer. Thank you. Okay, we have some results that are coming in. And it looks like as far as the number of procedures that have been performed, we have a mix between physicians that have done between zero and four Sonata, so new users, and those who have done 15 or more. So almost split. This is exciting. It's like <laughs> life changing. <laughs> it's like a race. Okay, so we have... Um, we're going to end the poll now. So the final results are that we have 43% that are both zero to four cases and 15 or more, and then 14% of our attendees that have done five to nine cases. So we have a nice mix of users uh, on our webinar tonight. And then the type of fibroids that have been treated for Sonata, the majority have treated intramural types three and four at 80%. And then at 60%, we're tied between submucosal types one and two and subserosal types five and six, followed by 40% of our audience treating with Sonata type two to five transmural. Wonderful. Thank you for answering our poll questions. 
We will use this as we move through tonight's discussion. Briefly, before I hand it over to Dr. Hansen Lindner and Dr. Shirazian for their experience with SmartOS 2.4, I want to take a quick moment to provide an overview of the enhanced software. To highlight a key new feature of SmartOS 2.4, the enhanced software introduces smaller ablation sizes, reducing Sonata's minimum ablation zone from 2.0 by 1.3 centimeters to 1.6 by 1.2 centimeters. Using the enhanced SmartOS 2.4, physicians are now able to treat smaller fibroids with increased precision treat small subserious or submucous fibroids with increased control, and treat fibroids that are difficult to access with increased flexibility. The two images presented provide a visual representation of the minimum ablation zone in previous software versus the minimum ablation zone in the new SmartOS 2.4. As you can see, physicians can now treat with increased precision, allowing you to confine ablations to the fibroid itself and avoiding adjacent uterine tissue if desired. In addition, you can now treat with increased control by treating fibroids closer to the serosa while still maintaining the thermal safety border within the serosa. I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Hansen Lindner and Dr. Shirazian as they discuss their experiences with the new SmartOS software. Thanks, everybody. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about why the new software was developed. Um, as we started doing these procedures back in 2020, uh, one of the things that we noticed early on was that there were certain fibroids that were either not able to be treated or uh, in, a, in a location where it made it challenging to confidently treat the fibroid um, from the standpoint of sparing the endometrium or uh, close proximity to the bladder um, or just uh, the location within the uterine wall, just not feeling confident that we could um, safely place the, the ablation zone in and have a space between the myometrium um, uh, and the serosal border and the endometrium. So early on, that was one of the first re requests that we asked the engineering team to consider looking into, which was a smaller treatment zone. And that they worked on that very, very diligently and uh, brought this and both Dr. Shrazi and I have been able to use it. And it has definitely give us some um, increased advantages to not only fibroids and in a, in a patient that we are treating some of their fibroids that allows us to treat more. But as um, many of you know, you can have one fibroid that can be creating the vast majority of a patient's problems and it can be difficult to access um, because of its location. I have a picture here of a um, fibroid that's in the lower uterine segment um, that's sitting somewhat adjacent to the bladder. Um, it's outlined, it's about four and a half by three centimeters, and you can see how it distorts the endometrium, but it's in the lower portion of the uterus. Um, it's uh, at a location where it's easily treated for some of it, but it can be a little more challenging to treat the area of the fibroid that's closer to the bladder. So the smaller zone allows us to do some smaller ablations with overlap, which provides a little more confidence of, um, of getting um, some of the fibroid that's closer to the bladder and closer to the lowest part of the uterus. Um, it also helps us to navigate that more narrow, uh, that more narrow region. Um, so the Current zone of 2.0 by 1.3 that we had uh, been used to using also, they've been able to reduce the size of that uh, safety zone. So that too gives us a little more uh, agility to place the device in the tissue and safely ablate. Next slide. So this is a patient um, that I've chosen to just to give some uh, further discussion about. 
uh, obviously some patients that come to you requesting Sonata do have a desire for future fertility or maybe not a desire, but uncertainty about whether or not they might pursue it. Um, and so early in my um, uh, use of Sonata, I was a little more reluctant to treat some of these patients because of concerns regarding um, the endometrium. And with the smaller device, I've taken an MRI um, and then blown up the section. Um, I don't think you can see my arrow, but on the right-hand picture, um, you can see several fibroids that are adjacent to the endometrium that are uh, quite small. You also can see a larger fibroid to the right of, of that. So uh, I wanted to talk about this patient and then get an idea from a poll um, uh, as to what you would want to do with this patient and then maybe have a discussion about what we ultimately decided. So this patient's 33. She's had one previous delivery. She has a history of very heavy bleeding and fibroids. Um, when I got her ultrasound, it was uh, definitely disproportionate to how her, the measurements that the sonographer gave me was disproportionate to her exam, which was also a little bit difficult because of a, a previous abdominoplasty that she had had. So I ordered an MRI um, and I'm, I'm glad I did because there's certainly a lot more fibroids than, than the ultrasound showed me. This patient had a large nine centimeter left lateral fibroid and then uh, several, about six to seven other fibroids that were type uh, two, three, and three to five. So she came to me for a consult as to whether or not she um, could have a procedure that could improve her bleeding. And um, I wanted to just take a poll and see what would all of you do if this patient came to you with uh, these concerns. And she does have an interest in future fertility, but is not um, absolutely certain that she will want another baby, but she would definitely want to consider it. Okay, so I'm going to launch our poll. And the question is, how would you have treated this patient? So if you could pick one from your choices below, we have hysterectomy, myomectomy, laparoscopic myomectomy, sonata system or other. So knowing what Dr. Hansen Lindner just described as this patient profile, if you could put in how you would have treated this patient, we will share those results in a moment. And people are still answering. Suspense. I know. Well, people are thinking about it, which is good. Okay, so I am going to end the poll with the result with the answers that we have submitted to now. And you all could see what we have here. So 50% would treat have treated this patient with Sonata. 25 with laparoscopic myomectomy, 13% at other and myomectomy, and no one with a hysterectomy. Great. So um, I talked to the patient about uh, myomectomy and Sonata and discussed with her where the majority of her symptoms are coming from. Um, the nine centimeter fibroid on the left-hand side is um, really, uh, obviously the largest one there, and it's contributing probably a little bit to her symptoms, but my guess is the submucosal, the type twos and the two to fives are the primary cause of her heavy bleeding. So we had a conversation about bulk symptoms versus heavy bleeding and her number one concern, which is this abdominoplasty, which had a very when I say it's taut, it is so taut and the, she has a very hypertrophic scar. So, um, and a displaced belly button, which is also uh, on so much stretch that uh, the scar is, is very hypertrophic. So she certainly would be a candidate for a laparoscopic myomectomy. That nine centimeter fibroid would be pretty easy to remove, but um, it'd be a little more difficult to remove um, the type two and type two to five fibroids without making a considerable number of incisions. So we talked about doing a laparoscopic myomectomy and a sonata fibroid ablation, either done together at the same time or doing them separately uh, in an 
two interval surgeries. Um, and we also talked about just doing Sonata. And ultimately she is a single mom. She didn't have a lot of uh, time that she could get off of work. So we have decided to proceed with Sonata fibroid ablation only, which of course gives her a much shorter recovery time. Um, and then she can continue to make decisions later about how to manage um, the larger fibroid if, if it even needs to be managed at all. So um, the decision that she came to with, um, with a lot of counseling is to proceed with um, a hysteroscopy with Sonata fibroid ablation. Any questions about this particular case or anybody want to comment? Yeah, Dr. Shrazian, anything that um, you might like to include as well? I know this wasn't your patient, but you have experience. Yeah. Of you know, it's tough because um, obviously there are a few choices for this patient. And we, we haven't discussed this patient before, so <laughs> we didn't talk about her before this, but um, she certainly does have the option for a lap myo um, plus Sonata. I probably, of all the options, if she really wanted to avoid an abdominal incision would have highly encouraged that and just because we all do know that fibroids will grow. She's only 33. So, you know, thinking about sort of all things, she might need another Sonata in the future. She might need something else. So as long as she knows that, I think that's what's important. Next slide. So this, this is actually one of my patients. Um, this, this is probably, so I think I have a favorite group for Sonata and I think my favorite group for Sonata, cause now having done so many of these procedures, I feel like, you know, there are some that you feel like when you use the technology, you know, you really got it. And then the patient is probably not going to need anything for a while. And I would say it's the group that has these tricky submucosal sort of either fully submucosal that are large and you know you cannot get away with one hysteroscopic resection because the fibroid is so big in the cavity that, you know, you're going to hit the deficit really quickly. Um, and so you already even going into it know that that's going to be the scenario for the kind of four centimeter submucosal fibroid. Um, so I really found that the addition of Sonata for the group of patients that have either fully submucosal or submucosal slash intramural fibroids that are in that tricky kind of, I'm going to say like three to five, six centimeter range um, is really great because you feel like you have done one procedure at one point in time that's been able to offer them something you know, very comprehensive. So this is my 25 year old patient who has a history of AUB, who has a very large submucosal slash slightly intramural fibroid, very big, distending the cavity, bleeding all the time, uh, may want fertility in the future. It's not currently seeking fertility, um, has tried a number of options in the past, has gone for hysteroscopy with other providers, has not, has still been bleeding you know, has come to me after having already tried like three hysteroscopies on the outside. And now she's here still with the large fibroid still bleeding. So I feel like this group, it's really great because we never had other choices for them. You know, we could offer them the hysteroscopy. We could tell them, all right, we hope to get as much as possible. You may need another hysteroscopy in the future. But I do find that with the Sonata technology, you can treat the fibroid. Two things, two very important things that I think are beneficial. One, the fibroid becomes relatively immediately softer or flakier so that you can resect more of it hysteroscopically. And two, your deficit doesn't go up dramatically. Um, and I think many of us, I know Dr. Hansen Linders noticed the same thing, we're, I don't exactly know why. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's just sort of that radio frequency um, sort of minimizes the outflow into kind of any open, um, open vascular, any open vascular system so that you don't lose so much um, fluid quickly. 
but it's true that you really don't have sort of an increasing deficit um, very quickly. So it's great because you can resect more of the fibroids. So I highly um, encourage the use of the Sonata for these kind of trickier, larger fibroids in either fully submucosal or submucosal intramural space. So that's this patient. Does Thank anyone you. have any questions or experience with that? Maybe someone in the audience has tried using it on a submucosal intramural fibroid. Yeah, please feel free to, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the Q&A or, or chat feature and uh, we'll be monitoring that. Yeah, and you know we can put in here, if we want to take a look at the poll for this, like knowing what Dr. Shirazian said, maybe thinking about before what how she was describing why she would use Sonata, what would you have treated with prior to hearing her reasoning, right? So was it always this a very clear Sonata patient for you for those physicians on here that have done 15 or more or those who have done under five? Um, or is it something where you may have thought to do something else initially, um, but now kind of understanding the reasoning behind what Dr. Shirazian is saying, you, you've changed your mind. So I think that would be a good thing. You're convincing Dr. Shirazian, everybody's saying Sonata. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Oh, wait, someone, someone is commenting. Yeah, so this is uh, Dr. Saeed, and she said, I've started doing Sonata first and then hysteroscopic resect second. Oh, I see, part second, and I find it easier to resect with myoshore as long as it's not obstructing my hysteroscopy. Yeah, I definitely think the treated portion of the fibroid is sort of softer, um, kind of flakier. You can actually see the area that you've treated. So I definitely encourage everyone to do a hysteroscopy if they have a fibroid that's at least partly in the cavity, because it's really interesting to kind of see what portion of it that is submucosal that you've treated. Um, and I know D Dr. Hansen Linder has had some experience with that too. I have. And, um, and I think like Tara said, we sort of stumbled into seeing this and then started to hear more people speak about it um, and and started to connect the dots with it. The um, treating of it definitely with the new software allows you to be able to uh, treat these fibroids much more easily because uh, sometimes the portion that's in the in the cavity, especially in a 25 year old, you you do want to be able to protect the endometrium carefully. So the smaller zone is perfect for one of these. You can certainly do overlapping zones, but it's that vasoconstriction that immediately occurs with the RF energy that then allows less uptake of the fluid. That that has definitely been a huge benefit. Um, and then, secondly, the the fluid evacuation system that pulls the tissue into the sock when you're using the myosure or in, in the cases where you use a resectoscope, the tissue is much softer. So there's fewer chips that you have to go after. Um, it's definitely more clear. Uh, it just allows for more removal of more tissue at that setting, especially if you're not able to get all of it, you know that you still have ongoing treatment so that if you do have to go back for uh, any kind of a second look hysteroscopy, there's significantly less than if you had just done a myosure. Tara, I have a question for you about how you would counsel this patient. Yes. Would would you say to her, um, you know, I'm going to treat this uh, with Sonata and there is a chance that you could need a subsequent hysteroscopy for spotting or potentially this fibroid moving more submucosal in, into the cavity? Or what do you typically tell patients when you're counseling them about these, especially these solitary, partially submucosal fibroids? Yeah. Um, well, even with hysteroscopy, I will counsel patients that if we resect the portion in the cavity, the portion that remains that's intramural could move into the cavity. They might need another procedure later. 
Um, so that's sort of always part of my counseling um, when I have these types of fibroids that are in between two locations. Um, but I will say, I usually tell them that I feel with Sonata, I could potentially get more of the fibroid out, um, that I'll, that I will take extra care to avoid the, you know, endometrium or blading the endo endometrium considerably. This patient is very young, but, you know, I typically do have much older patients um, that I also see that have this type of fibroid. Um, and, you know, I find that most patients would obviously rather do everything they can to avoid a second procedure, um, especially if they've been to other people and have had the traditional procedure already. You know, they want to do something different. So I'm not going to do just a straight hysteroscopy anymore on the patient that's already been to two other doctors and has had two other hysteroscopies. So that's not uncommon to see that. So really the choice is either this or a myomectomy to remove the fibroid the other way. And then we have the conversation about C-section at delivery versus vaginal delivery. So, um, but in my mind, that's sort of like, we need to take care of this. So what's going to take care of it the best, you know? Um, so that becomes the decision point. I think we have. Yeah, we have another question. Dr. Um, Farr, hi. <laughs> hi, Sarah. So her, her question is, I also love to use, well, she said, hello, Dr. Tarazian. Um, I also love to use Sonata for this patient type, sometimes twice. I had huh? several patients who have passed large pieces of fibroid after Sonata of these types of fibroids. Despite the pain with passing these pieces, the patients have been so happy with the result. Most notable patient was one whose submucosal fibroid shrunk from six centimeter to four centimeters. Nice. Have yeah, I, I mean, for passing of the chips, like, yes. So sometimes when we go in, we ablate and then we um, use the scope, you know, we're not going to get every little piece out or it's going to continue to shrink and you're going to get more shedding. So actually two very important points um, about that. Um, one, I make sure that I counsel patients that they will continue to notice both tissue discharge and bleeding post-procedure because there will be some irregular bleeding. And so it's better to just anticipate and prepare patients that that is part of what they will see. Um, and then two, I like to do a swipe with the polyp forcep at the end and just kind of grab any chunks that are sitting there in the cavity that maybe we didn't quite see or we didn't quite get. So I do like to do a last pass with um, usually a polyp forcep to just kind of grab any other pieces, or you could do it with the curette or something else. But um, but I think that it is common that you could have some chips. So you just sort of want to prepare your patients. But I'm so happy that she's also noticed some, some difference there, which again, this was a group. The reason I'm particularly excited about this group is because it's a group traditionally we didn't have a lot for. So it, it fills a particular niche. Perfect. Any other um, comments, Dr. Hansen Lindner or uh, Tara, does that look like all the questions that have come through thus far? Yes, those are all of the questions we have unless uh, you have anything to add, Dr. Hansen Lindner. No, that, that sounds great. Great. Move on to the next uh, case study. Let's see. Here we go. So um, I would echo Tara's uh, thoughts about what's my favorite fibroid. This is um, a very similar uh, fibroid to the one that she showed, although this one is definitely more of a three to five. And you can see in the left-hand image, you actually can see the blood vessels over the upper surface of this fibroid by the darkened circles um, um, at the edge of the fibroid. And then on the lower right uh, fibroid, you can see how this fibroid approaches the endometrium. And, uh, and this is really what's giving this patient such significant um, heavy bleeding. And she really wanted to avoid a hysterectomy. Um, she had a sort of a remote interest in future childbearing. This fibroid is about four and a half centimeters. 
um, type two with only about 10% of it being in the lining of the uterus, um, or sorry, in the cavity, but 10% to give you a sense of um, the portion that's giving her the greatest symptoms. So why don't we do the poll, Tara, and see what most people would do? Sure. So the question is up. So please answer how you would treat this patient. Uh, hysterectomy, myomectomy, laparoscopic myomectomy, sonata, or other. So our was answers. Main symptom here, um, Leslie, was it bleeding? Bleeding. Was that her main symptom. Main symptom. Yes. Okay, so it looks like we are at 100% for Sonata. <laughs> no one would use a Mirena IUD. Come on, guys. <laughs> so I didn't even have on here what she failed, <laughs> but, you know, I'm a big Mirena fan, and <laughs> we're in, sadly, such anti-Mirena sentiment uh, because of the hormones. There's too many influencers suggesting that it does things that it doesn't, but... Um, and she, I, I think at one point actually had passed her Mirena as well, just because of her clots being so big. So she's a patient that I would um, say she would be a great laparoscopic myomectomy candidate, and she would also be a great Sonata candidate. And so I try to give patients um, just a good idea of what would be a good choice for them and then outline what's the procedure, what's the recovery, what's the expectations, and then let them make the decision. Um, by doing the Sonata, it doesn't eliminate the possibility of doing a laparoscopic myomectomy later at some point, if for any reason she didn't get the response that she wanted. And there's certainly, um, like one of the previous users had mentioned that, that you can always do another Sonata down the road if needed. Um, if a patient gets some improvement, but maybe would like to try for more, I had somebody come back after three years um, after she had gotten a really great result with a Sonata and she came back three years later, had developed a new fibroid. And she said, can I just get another one of those Sonatas again? And, and absolutely there's uh, it's like having a second hysteroscopy. It's of, of little consequence to do it again. If the patient um, got a good result or wanted to try and treat that, that fibroid a little bit further. So obviously we don't do this to, to try and have, um, we, we'd like to do it uh, with just one procedure in the lifetime. We want to have as little of a reintervention rate as possible. The in all the data points that they've shown that the the reintervention rate is about one to two percent at one year. It's about five percent at two years, and about eight to nine percent at three to five years. So, um, obviously, as we treat more and more fibroids and bigger uteruses, the reintervention rate for some of those more expansive patients might be higher. But for a patient like this, the goal is really one procedure to treat this fibroid. But I think she would be a great candidate for either one of laparoscopic myomectomy or the Sonata. And I find that most patients want Sonata. So I, I think it's helpful for them to have choices, um, but very few people would choose the myomectomy unless they just wanted it gone. And I will say that that's a point about counseling that I learned um, to be very clear about in my counseling is that Sonata does not make the fibroid disappear like myomectomy does. And Sonata is an investment. You treat the fibroid, the first period afterwards might be slightly better, but it's really the second and third period afterwards and beyond where you see the biggest improvement in the reduction in bleeding. So helping them to understand that it's not like a myomectomy, the difference is, is that it causes reduction and especially reduction in vascular flow. Tara, do you have anything to add with that? Um, yes, there is nothing to say that you can't use more than one treatment on each patient. So meaning, um, meaning that you can combine therapies. You could do a Sonata, for example, and then place the IUD after you do the Sonata. So just, um, I think it's just important to note that 
the sonata also doesn't have to be done by itself. You can combine it with other therapies to try and achieve best results for the patient, obviously depending on what they want and what their goals are. But um, but a sonata plus IUD is actually a very common combination that I use that a lot of patients seem to really like because it will dramatically decrease their bleeding. And, um, you know, even that first cycle will be a lot less because you've treated the fibroid and introduced the IUD and resected the portion that was in the cavity. So their periods will get a lot better. And, you know, it sort of also buys you time for that fibroid uh, to shrink. Um, oh, and also another point I wanted to make is that if you do decide to do a laparoscopic myomectomy on this group that have had a sonata, um, I have also found that your planes are really not disrupted and you could easily go ahead and perform a surgery post sonata, subsequent surgery if need be, like a myomectomy without you know, feeling like there's distortion of the planes, because I think that's something that, you know, often people wonder because it's radio frequency ablation, but it doesn't affect sort of the planes of the fibroid in the same way, let's say like a UAE would. So I think that's also important. Great. Tara, did I see a, um, a new comment or question pop in? Um, so that was it, Tara's. That was, that was me asking oh, sorry. The, 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 the audience to put questions in the chat. Um, I did have a question that, that was direct, though, also. That was um, if both of you could just highlight a little bit about your personal experience using the new 2.4 and, you know, how has that made your patient selection evolve or how has your patient selection evolved from starting to doing, you know, hundreds of sonatas to where you are today? I'll let you go first. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm actually treating more fibroids at the smaller zone. Like it, it, it before I would probably not, if not opt to treat the really small ones that were in a precarious location. Um, but now I think it's expanded sort of the number of fibroids that I treat because it's rare that I have just one fibroid, right? Uh, let's talk about the fact that most patients that have fibroids have many fibroids, have more than one, at least fibroid. Um, so it requires, you know, when you're treating multiple fibroids, it requires sort of a, a, like a broad range of kind of technique. So being able to apply a smaller zone for the fibroids that are closer to the endometrium or in the endometrium or more cervical or, you know, maybe closer to the bladder or subserosal potentially, um, I think it just gives you more flexibility in being able to treat more types of fibroids in the same setting. And I would echo that. And there um one of the referral bases that send me patients is our reproductive endocrinology group um, for patients whose fibroids are distorting the cavity in preparation for IVF. Um, so these patients often have had a previous myomectomy or they have just a two centimeter fibroid that's uh, distorting the endometrium and they have been counseled as to laparoscopic myomectomy, this particular case that I'm thinking of really didn't have um, enough of that fibroid uh, in the cavity to even consider it to be hysteroscopically approached. So these are the patients that I have found, um, especially if they're near the cornua, uh, trying to avoid any proximity to the tube, and then the fibroids that are just posterior to the endometrium, I think it's opened up um, a big avenue to be able to treat these patients with more confidence. And we should say, um, I'm not sure if it was obvious in the, the first picture with the new um, smart zone, the, the space between the area that's treated, so the red zone and the green zone is a lot smaller. 
So it means that the time of treatment is a lot shorter. So you can treat a small fibroid in under like a minute often or about a minute. Um, and it really keeps sort of the radio frequency directed right into the center. There's not a huge um, zone of spread. And so it's more targeted, it's faster, um, and you can sort of blast these smaller fibroids that are in locations that are more precarious potentially, um, you know, than you would have been able to do otherwise. Quick question for the both of you. I know a lot of times um, in regards to the smaller ablation zone, sometimes we talk about, you know, the smaller fibroids that we want to really contain the ablation zone too. But do you believe that this will really allow you to um, treat maybe some of the larger fibroids that are closer to the serosa and target more of that fibroid for those patients? I, I do think so. Um, and I think especially for the newer users too, um, because I think the one of the things that I found in the beginning that was one of my bigger challenges was just having that confidence to be able to place the device in and get it as close to the edge of the fibroid as I felt was safe. And um, I think knowing that you have a smaller zone that's uh, able to get you to the full uh, sphere of the fibroid, uh, you may do you know, more of the smaller zones in the beginning, but you'll have less worry about um, treating adjacent myometrium or placing the, uh, the ablation zone in an area that as you turn the device to do the safety checks, uh, you can talk yourself out of certain ablations because you don't feel like it's as safe. I think that will happen much less frequently because of the size of the smaller zone. Great. Dr. Shrazian, anything? To I mean, I think you can use it in that way. I just think you have to be prepared if you have a larger fiber to do lots of small zones because this is volume dependent. So you really need to be thinking about your fibroid in terms of the volume of the fibroid that you're treating. Um, but I really do like that it's sort of fast and targeted. And I agree with Dr. Hansen Linder that it really, if you're a new user, it's going to make you feel more comfortable because you're not placing these elect you know, all of these sort of electrodes, if you will, or, you know, um, or spikes into the fibroid and then leaving it there for four minutes and wondering, you know, did I place that correctly? Is that, is that okay? So it sort of lets you dip your feet in the water, if you will, and try sort of more targeted smaller zones until you get comfortable, you know, feeling like you can treat the whole thing. So I think that's a really great use for the newer users here. I think that's a really great way to try the waters. Great. Yeah. I think we might have uh, one more case study. Do we wanna? So um, this patient um, is a really interesting fibroid. Uh, this is an SIS that was done. Um, this patient was uh, 38, she'd had one previous C-section. She had a fundal fibroid that was a type, technically it was a type three to six on the right-hand image, I would say it looks like a type two to six, measuring about five centimeters. The SIS showed that it probably was um, submucosal. However, when she was taken to hysteroscopy by my partner, the uterus expanded completely. And this fibroid was not accessible at all with the MyAssure, which is what he was uh, using to, um, to treat her. So uh, he sent her to me uh, to treat with Sonata and uh, she had a, a really great response. Um, and this is somebody that I, I treated in my kind of early day, early days, she was on the birth control pill. And, and about a year after she had had her sonata, the fibroid had reduced in size tremendously from about five centimeters down to about 1.8 centimeters. And it had become completely submucosal, which is not a surprise looking at that right-hand picture. 
I mean, she had some persistent spotting. So I went in and resected that 1.8 centimeter fibroid. Um, and she had been pretty ambivalent about um, ever getting pregnant again. We'll go on to the next slide. You can see on the left-hand side, she's got a little ongoing pregnancy. So I brought this uh, slide and picture in just to talk about fertility considerations. Um, it's important to ask your patient if they do want to get pregnant again in the future and that they are aware that the data on fertility is um, is limited. We only have about 100 to 105 pregnancies that have been documented. There certainly may be more. Um, the data for this kind of conservative group of people is reassuring there haven't been any postpartum hemorrhages, uh, morbidly adherent placentas, growth restriction, uterine ruptures. Um, there were about 30% of patients that ultimately had a vaginal delivery and the remainder had C-sections, all of which were for typical obstetrical reasons, not for um, rupture or uh, anything like that. So um, it, it is certainly something to not be afraid of if they want to have future fertility, but you just wanna be cautious about the counseling um, and let them know what we do know about it and that um, if there's something that they do consider in the future to make certain to have, um, some ongoing surveillance with like maternal fetal medicine, just to take a look at the uh, location of the placenta and watch them carefully in pregnancy. I do have somebody right now who's pregnant, um, who has had a previous vaginal delivery and we're having conversations as to whether or not she should have a vaginal delivery or not. And, We've made this discussion that she, since it wasn't completely transmural, this is not this patient, but a separate patient, that she could consider a vaginal delivery, but it's going to be just shared decision-making and that she should be treated like a VBAC, no cytotech, um, uh, you know, no prolonged second stage, that kind of thing. So does anybody have any questions about fertility after, after Sonata? Tara, do you have any thing to add about fertility? I mean, I think it's, as you said, it's just an, it's a discussion. Um, you know, the data that we have is limited, but, you know, so far is reassuring. We certainly need more data. So if anyone here has been using the system and has had patients get pregnant, you know, we really do want to know about those those pregnancies and results because I think that's the way we accumulate data. So um, clearly, that would that would be um, that would be appropriate. But you know, with myomectomy, we also have extensive counseling around pregnancy. So I feel that you know, even if we were to do a myomectomy, we would aggressively counsel the patient to wait before um, before pregnancy, at least three months post myomectomy. And someone actually just asked that question. Um, and usually I do say three months um, because that's what I say to my myomectomy patient. So I keep it standard because we don't really have that data at this point. Um, but, you know, I think with myomectomy, we have a whole set of counseling and just things to sort of be aware of. And, and this is the same. We, we don't have all the data to know exactly how to manage um, when they are pregnant. And I saw the question pop up about uh, duration to advise waiting. Um, the earliest pregnancy that has occurred has been three months after Sonata. Um, and then they're all of the rest have been, you know, a number of months or even years later. So counseling typically with myomectomy is three months um, to six months. It used to be six and that number sort of has dropped back. I think you could probably make the argument that three for maybe some uh, limited one or two fibroid ablations, if there were multiple, probably a little bit longer. But I think in that in that range would be very reasonable. Great. Well, thank you both. Any other um, questions or comments from our audience regarding um, the new SmartOS 2.4, how that may expand your patient selection, 
Um, anything that we discussed here today? No other questions are coming in, Bridget. Perfect. Well, with that, um, Dr. Hanson Linder, Dr. Shirazian, any kind of last uh, tidbits that you'd like to leave the group with? Otherwise, okay. just okay. feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And if you have any specific cases, I know I can speak for both Dr. Hanson Linder and I, we'd be, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, if anyone would like to come and see a Sonata, I'm in New York City. She's in Charlotte. You know, I'm sure we'd be happy to have visitors and kind of um, show you how the new system works and or the more the conventional older system works and how we choose patients. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining the discussion tonight. Um, we're really excited for all of you to use um, the enhanced Smart OS 2.4. Um, excited about how that will expand your patient selection um, and really get us all to treat more fibroids and help more women. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.